Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, and welcome to New Books and Genocide Studies, part of the New Books Network of podcasts. My name is Kelly McFall from Newman University, and I'm a host on the channel. And today I'm thrilled to be talking with Michelle Gordon and Rachel O'Sullivan. Together, they are the editors of a terrific new volume. We'll talk about that word choice in just a moment. Volume titled Colonial Paradigms of Violence, Comparative Analysis of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Mass Killing. Michelle and Rachel, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us on New Books in Genocide Studies. Thanks for having us. (laughs) So I want to start where we always do, which is to give you a chance just to briefly introduce yourself to the audience. So Rachel, I'll start with you. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you came to be interested in this kind of a topic. Yeah, my name is Rachel O'Sullivan. Uh, hi to all the listeners. Um, maybe you can guess from my surname. I'm Irish. I'm from Dublin. Um, I did my bachelor's, my master's in University College Dublin, and then I moved over to the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, so not too far, uh, where I did a PhD with Stefan Malinowski and Donald Bloxham. Um, and then in 2019, I came over to Munich, and I'm a postdoc here at the Institute for Zeichgeschichte, or in English, the Institute for Contemporary History, and I work in the Centre for Holocaust Studies. Um, Coming from Ireland, I guess you always have this sort of awareness of colonialism. Um, You grow up with it, you can't really escape it in the Irish school system. It's sort of really um, integrated into our our city landscape, our national anthem, really, really our national identity. And so I guess colonial history was always sort of in the background of my mind. Uh, but my grandfather was actually a prisoner of war during the Second World War. So as a child, I was always interested in that topic. And I guess that somehow led to me mixing both Second World War history and colonial history. Interesting. Thank you. What about you, Michelle? Yeah. Um, hi to everyone. Um, I am from the UK and come from a different side of thinking about uh, how one is taught colonial history in education. Um I did my BA at London South Bank University, and then I did both my master's and my PhD in history at Royal Holloway. Uh, my PhD supervisor was Dan Stone, and my um, focus originally, at least during my undergrad, was very much on Holocaust studies. And uh, when I came to meet Dan at Royal Holloway, he kind of introduced me to the world of comparative genocide studies. And through that then, which will of course be relevant in our discussions today, I came to the British Empire and the extreme violence being perpetrated, having been perpetrated across it. And as I said, my experience is very much the opposite of Rachel's, that we don't talk about colonialism or colonial violence. Um, And again, that will filter through today in terms of the education systems. But... um, I moved to Uppsala University in 2018 after my PhD as a postdoctoral researcher in genocide studies and have, over the last couple of years, been working on externally funded projects from the Swedish Research Council. And for uh, those of you in the audience who have been listening for a while, uh, both Donald and um, Dan have been on the show multiple times, and you can go listen to their interviews Um on the webpage or through whatever uh, podcast provider you use. Um, This is, I will just say, this is, this is a fascinating book. Um, And I just may have postponed some of the grading I was supposed to be doing so that I could be reading these essays instead. Um, Michelle, maybe I'll start with you. Why did you decide this book need, or this volume? Again, we'll get to that in a minute. Monograph, whatever word we're going to use. Why did you decide to spend years of your life, your and Rachel's life, working on this? What? Why is that this book necessary then, three or four years ago? Okay, well, I guess I could answer that, um, but I don't know. Maybe because the relationship kind of formed the other way that this yeah. was Rachel's initiative. We so start maybe Rachel Rachel should like. start with why she came to me to involve me in this book for several sure. years. <laughs> Um, yeah, so from my side, uh, the Center for Holocaust Studies organizes 
multiple conferences every year and I was sort of given the honor of choosing a topic and as it was my research topic I thought why not um, I approached Michelle out of the blue just sent her an email and I said hey I've read some of your articles uh, how do you feel about organizing something together and I guess our main goal when we sort of initially met on Zoom was to basically bring together scholars who work in quite different disciplines that tend to sort of cross over with one another, but never really um, tended to interact with each other in person. So maybe for a bit of an explanation, Holocaust studies, it's almost a sort of discipline of its own within Second World War history. There is, of course, branches of it, um, sort of gender history, history of homosexuality, uh, violence, perpetrator sites, etc. It's, it's a really uh, diverse field, actually. And there is this one sort of subsection that works on this sort of comparative Holocaust history. But it was often the case that historians of colonial colonialism were writing about the Holocaust or historians of the Holocaust were writing about colonialism and they were never really interacting with one another. And so I saw Michelle's background and we came together and we thought, how do we sort of open a dialogue between these different people? Um, how do we not necessarily solve questions of how you compare genocide or the Holocaust and colonialism, but more so how do we bring together different experts and perhaps pose new questions? And we were also very aware of the fact that we didn't just want to talk about strengths of comparison, but also the weaknesses and the challenges that we face. And because, of course, you can't be an expert in, in every area, um, so yeah, the idea was to sort of cover multiple topics. And unfortunately, um, we planned the, the conference for November 2020. And of course, COVID then happened. Uh, so it was an online conference in the end. But that was the sort of, um, I guess, the formation for for the volume. And I can just say that I was incredibly happy to receive Rachel's email um, because, yes, yeah, it's kind of indicative throughout the volume. One can sometimes be quite alone in the areas that we're looking at because you can obviously get some animosity kind of from Holocaust studies, but then also from historians of empire. And I personally don't really fit, feel that I fit within like a certain group quite neatly. And so it's great to, to be around other people that are also trying to, yeah, disentangle these complexities um, in a way that is productive and, um, yeah, outside of the kind of animosities uh, that you sometimes face uh, looking at these topics. So I swapped around word choices for what to call this for a while. So Rachel, given that you, you're there, can you say something about this series and and what it's meant to do and and what this where this particular manuscript fits into that yeah so the center for holocaust studies has a a volume series i guess you would call it um it's also called a book uh, depending on on who you talk to uh, but it's essentially an english language series published with Wallstein. So they're a german publisher it's called european holocaust studies or ehs um, as we we shorten it to usually we have within a volume research articles some sort of source analysis a round table discussion or a historiographical review and then a really nice part is usually the project descriptions where we highlight uh, new and upcoming research or sort of recently finished projects um, PhD projects or postdoc projects sometimes even master's projects and I guess the whole idea behind it is um, the Center for Holocaust Studies is one of the leading centers for Holocaust research in Germany we're very international we publish a lot in English but we wanted to sort of uh, connect this this newer research coming from um, both America, Europe, Eastern Europe, of course, Israel, um, to promote younger scholars and to promote exchange between the scholars too. Um, and I should probably mention that the newest volume, volume five, has just come out in mm. April. It's on the topic of childhood during war and genocide. Mm. And the next volume is upcoming, hopefully will actually be out at the end of the year, that is on Jewish councils in Nazi-occupied Europe. And what's uh, really interesting is that we're actually now part of an open access project. So the newest volume is available completely free online mm. to download. Um, and hopefully 
the next volume should also be available. And we're also in discussions to hopefully get the um, older volumes also available online. So uh, yeah, maybe keep an eye out on the Valstein website um, because you might get a free, a free volume uh, to download. Thank you. Um, longtime listeners will know that I am scribbling down the fact that I have my next interview topic now laid out for me, volume five. Um, but that's good. Um, so maybe as we, as we start to think about the book, um, this is um, this book emerged at a particular point in a in a, a, as discussion starts and continues to wrestle with this question of colonialism and mass violence, right? And so this book has a history in terms of the debate, and so you you cover this in the introduction for people who are not. Um, professional Holocaust historians. I wonder if you could situate this volume. What what started this discussion about colonialism and mass violence and this intersection with the Holocaust? Um, and I don't know. I, I'll I'll invite Michelle to start, but and and then you all can kind of talk through it. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for for the very big question, which I'll try and answer as quickly as I can. Um, I guess in terms of who started it, I suppose Raphael Lumpkin, mm. who coined the term genocide, started this because even though his conceptualization of what genocide meant wasn't ultimately all included in the UN definition in the Convention of Genocide, uh, yeah, Convention of Genocide, sorry. Um, but still, we know that he looked at the history of world history of empire, different time periods, different continents. And the Holocaust, or what obviously first later became what we know as the Holocaust, um, was not necessarily the kind of focal point at that point. So he started it in that sense. And I would say that other philosophical thinkers, such as Hannah Arendt, also kind of pulled on this idea of um, what she would call the boomerang thesis. So this idea that Nazi genocide and Nazi violence was in some ways a form of European imperialism come home, so boomeranging back. We also have other anti-colonial critics such as W.E.D.B. Du Bois and M.A. Césaire, etc., who found it very obvious that there were clear similarities between European colonialism and what was being perpetrated by the Nazis. So in that sense, it was there from from the beginning. Um, but of course, Holocaust studies wasn't in the kind of 60s and 70s what it is now. So of course, first the Holocaust needed to be uh, gaining further attention. And then into the 1980s, when we see comparative genocide studies forming, uh, it was also the case that there was very much this idea of the, um, the agency of uh, genocide being the state. So mm-hmm. that really was such a focal point in the 80s that yeah, colonialism doesn't really kind of fit with that. So it wasn't really looked at. But um, to kind of move forward to another important time is the work, of course, of Jürgen Zimmerer Mm -hmm. and his idea of a continuity thesis in which he looked at German colonial violence and um, genocide against the Herrera and Arma, more specifically in what is today's Namibia. Um, And he was making more direct continuities than maybe we would talk about now, but he was, yeah, this argument that some lines were crossed during the German Empire, the Kaiserreich, and, uh, um, yeah, through this breaking of taboos that we can see this line from uh, Windhoek to Auschwitz, as as he would say. Um, And while that continuity thesis has maybe kind of moved along a bit, um, that's kind of where this impetus is coming, a revisiting then of both what Anna, Hannah Arendt said, but also of Raphael Lemkin's original intent with his with his work. Um, maybe I should just explain a little bit what the issue is with the idea of colonial genocide. Mm-hmm. And of course, we have to kind of think retroactively about this because, of course, it wasn't a concept at the time. But one of the central issues is, of course, that um, the genocide or violence perpetrated in colonization processes is usually perpetrated by settlers rather than the state. So that obviously has been a sticking point in terms of the development of the field and also the debates, which I'm sure we will get to discuss. 
um, of course, on the other side of that, which maybe I don't know if Rachel wants to uh, take over in terms of the challenges within this of where the Holocaust sits with this and how we talk mm -hmm. about these issues related to Holocaust studies. Yeah, I, thanks for the, the summary and also to, to play back a bit on, on Jürgen Zimmer. Um, he also fits this mod, mod, the sort of mold, I guess, of being a, a colonial historian who then explored this thesis of, of linking German colonialism during the Kaiserreich to the Holocaust, which at the time a lot of Holocaust historians really didn't appreciate, um, essentially that he had missed what they saw as some really like fundamental specific aspects of, mm. of the Holocaust. And so we did see a sort of movement away from this direct continuity, although it still really actually informs a lot of the debate to this day, but a movement away um, from this sort of direct continuity towards more of a, a bit more of a flexible sort of conceptual framework idea. Um, how could the Holocaust fit within these sort of global patterns? And, and we see that more recently as well in in research uh, that tends to focus on on things like memory, for example, um, memory in post-colonial societies. Um, how did knowledge of the Holocaust sort of inform um, people's perceptions in these societies? Um, but perhaps also important to mention is um, on one side, there's this academic debate, but on the other side, there's a public debate, which really informs quite a lot of my work in, in Germany today. It, it touches on what we talked about at the start of the volume, um, Dirk Moses' uh, mm -hmm. post-German catechism, it's called, uh, basically, yeah, almost sort of fired these shots at German remembrance culture um, that is actually uh, still, you know, it's, it's still really a heated debate to this day. Um, it can also be very political. It can be sometimes hard for me as, as a foreigner here in Germany um, to sort of weigh in on these debates. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's also this sort of um, public side to it that really... Um, more so ask the question of um, how unique was the Holocaust or, you know, are we allowed to compare the Holocaust, which was sort of, yeah, I guess it's got a different weight to it than sort of the, the sort of academic analysis that we do. That's a really wonderful summary. Let me let me poke at one or two things in that and, and see if we can untangle some things. One of them is, and I, I, I said, we, we talked a little bit, I guess, by email about this. You can use the term colonialism or imperialism in a very specific way to talk about European expansion in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, uh, or maybe more broadly to expand the time horizon with that. Or we can talk about colonialism more conceptually as a way of organizing societies uh, that um, has happened across space and time. How do you, how does this debate imagine colonialism is this you know i think uh some of the, the 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 this initial discussion about whether you can connect i don't know german southwest africa to the holocaust imagine it in a very specific way um how do you imagine colonialism as you think about this debate is this a time not time bound is not the right way of putting it but this is is this a debate which is specifically about the holocaust and 19th and 20th century mass violence or is this a global timeless kind of set of dynamics that functions i don't know in terms of the dynamics of human nature and human institutions uh, i'll just ask rachel to go first but i imagine this is a broader discussion yeah, thank you for the the question. It's 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 a really tough one that I also sort of face with in my own work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm not a sort of historian of colonialism by by trade, I guess. Um, so it is sometimes hard to sort of nail down what colonialism is to an extent. I think it's Jürgen Osterhammel who sort of says that like colonialism is this phenomenon of colossal vagueness and there's so many sort of examples that are very specific to specific contexts mm. um so it does sometimes depend within the sort of academic debate on the historian so we have people like like Keikel, P. Keikel, for example in our volume who is using a very definite metal uh, model of settler colonialism or um Jagwiga 
as Kutsa mm-hmm. as well, like the same sort of concept that mm-hmm. they're using something a bit more specific. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas someone like Dorota Glovachia and her article is, is using a more sort of wider, more flexible notion, in this case, um, settler colonial gaze almost, a, a bit like less of a specific analytical model. Um, I get a sense that in this debate, there is more so, I mean, it really depends on, on who you're talking yeah. to and where their expertise lie. I believe there is more so of a movement towards this more sort of flexible, broader global sort of understanding the sort of timeless understanding of colonialism that it's a sort of a system of domination that operates through these various sort of methods or processes of for example racial hierarchies expansion settler settler settling um territories deportation etc um so really more sort of moving towards that which to an extent i guess you then maybe risk um removing some of the the nuances so the specificity um but on the other hand you know each each case is very specific um so we do have this this big term colonialism but at the same time you know each each territory is unique in its own way but maybe i mean michelle you work more so on on yeah, this within the sort of genocide context, so maybe you would disagree with me. Uh, no, I wouldn't disagree with anything that you said. I was just thinking about yeah, how I actually yeah, it's a great question. How do I actually kind of impose this notion in my head in different categories? And I guess the thing that I found um, quite useful is that Moses's concept of the racial century, which he says is from 1850 to 1950. Um, obviously, I would not necessarily say and I'm sure he maybe wouldn't either that 1950s is some cutoff point in this Mm -hmm. sense uh then of course we're maybe just going into the practices of colonization through decolonization maybe we could say but I think that this shift in the mid-19th century particularly from this racialized idea of hierarchies systems of management of peoples Mm -hmm. and this racialized violence becomes something yeah more specific I would say so when we think about Mark Levine's book, for example, and this idea of turn of the century violence, there is something that we kind of see coming together as practices of colonization, practices of colonial warfare and violence that I think is useful. That doesn't necessarily answer the question of what is colonialism, but yeah. I think in terms of that, this essence of, of, of what was the driving force for the violence, I think that that's kind of an a useful way of thinking about it. Yeah, I'm reminded reading the essay and even just listening to the two of you introduce yourselves, the way in which expanding the kind of time limits of colonialism allows many regions to at one point in time to have been both colonizer and colonized, which adds an interesting kind of wrinkle to all of this. Well, I wish we had time to talk about each essay individually. We do not. So I would like to kind of structure our discussion around some of the themes that you brought up in the introduction um, and just kind of ask you to to talk about how the volumes in this essay contribute to each of these themes. And I'd like to start with what you already raised, which is this this question about how, how and to what extent colonial violence defined narrowly as this European expansion in the 19th and 20th century, uh, led to or influenced violence within Europe. Um, and and mostly your essays address the Holocaust, so that you've got this really interesting essay on the Spanish Civil War as well. Um, so, Michelle, I'll just ask you to start with that, um, and, and then you all can talk. Okay, uh, thanks. I just wanted to say, just going back to what yeah. we said a second ago, I thought, um, kind of rereading the roundtable, that both Edward Kesey and Awika mm-hmm. Linda point out that the histories of empire, genocide, and violence have always been entangled. So I think that's really the the kind of starting mm-hmm. point, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and let me just try and... I had that in my head while you were asking your question, so... But, yeah, sorry, just you. to think about the extent to which colonial violence led to an influence violence within Europe. So how yeah. it kind of came back or mm-hmm. maybe this kind of, um, I guess one way of thinking about it is this kind of traffic going in both directions, because I think it's important in the 
period that we're talking about and that the book looks at, and for example, the article on the Spanish Civil War, is that subject to which country it is, obviously military men are kind of going back and forth between contexts. So they may fight in three European wars and then they may, you know, two weeks later be somewhere else and they're kind of learning these practices. And yeah, we talked about this idea of imperial clouds, which is this concept that Christoph Kamisik and Johannes Kreienbaum um, put together in an article, which I think is really useful. And yeah, the, the, this idea, for example, then with the Spanish Civil War, that we see this level of extreme violence somehow interacting then with the, the colonial violence that was perpetrated in the Spanish protectorate in, in Morocco. Um, but I think that the volume, yeah, speaks to these crossovers quite a bit. So Sarah Ellis, for example, brings a kind of more empirical mm-hmm. research article bringing together three personalities because this kind of feeds off this notion of Jürgen Zimmerer's idea of continuity thesis, which obviously has yeah, some issues with it. But actually, Sarah does something which is quite exceptional, I think, in that she really does, she is able to place these men in, in both contexts. So she's looking at the experimentation on humans in both colonial and then the Nazi era. So the, we really see that the ways in which this kind of transfer can go back and forth. And maybe if I could come in um, also with, for example, um, Pete Kegel's article, this idea of Hitler um, potentially seeing that the Wild West as this sort of ideal model or this this sort of tying into this fantasy of of space, but also racial ordering, um, this idea that these, these sort of colonial imaginings actually existed in, in Germany pre-1939, pre-1933, that they'd been around for, for quite a while, certainly during the, the Kaiser Reich, um, you know, colonial violence wasn't something that was hidden or necessarily unusual. And also these sort of, I guess, potentially to take even a step back um, or earlier than colonial violence, sort of ideology that that dehumanized certain populations. And um, we see it a lot in the case of the Kaiser Reich, and um, the sort of Polish or the Prussian territories, how were they talking about people in Eastern Europe? How were they talking about Slavic people um, that really sort of portrayed them in a way um, that later sort of radicalizes um, this, this sort of uh, as an other, maybe not necessarily colonial other, but it's certainly along these similar lines. So although during during the sort of pre-1939 era, you know, Maybe they weren't necessarily practicing violence, but it's this sort of ideology, this, this dehumanizing, this sort of racialization that comes back into play again during during Nazi violence. And I think that's also an important part of this sort of idea of a kind of colonial archive where these ideas that are just sort of present in the minds of people at the time. You talked about imagining. So another one of the themes in the book is the way in which mass violence is often preceded by genocidal imagination or imaginings. Uh, Rachel, can you, can you say a little bit more about what that means and maybe how that comes out of this volume? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, to an extent, sometimes I when because I'm, I'm a Holocaust historian, so I always have to bring it back a little bit to the sort of specifics of, of the Holocaust, which, of course, is that it's not just, um, you know, the Jewish victims were not just those in these sort of, in inverted commas, colonial territories of Poland, um, but they're also German Jews, um, mm-hmm. Jews from Europe who who are also... Um, you know they are also they're they're ultimately exterminated more or less they are killed and so the holocaust always has this slightly different um different part to it um but again um the, what we know about certainly nazi germany is this interlinking between race and space and i think that comes back to many of the sort of topics of of how do we link the sort of concept or maybe a flexible concept of, of genocide with also colonial territory, colonial expansion. Um, also perhaps to tie in a bit with Dirk Moses' idea of, of this sort of security, um, that it's not just about um, conquering space, but it's also about reordering it in certain ways. And certainly in the case of the Nazis, we see a very extreme version of 
this elimination and that's elimination through violence or elimination through assimilation because that also happens um and i think that these these ideas you know we tend to sort of put the holocaust in in a box i guess away from from a lot of stuff but um you know these sort of imaginings these ideas these sort of projections onto territory are something that has been going on for for much longer time um michelle maybe you can say more on this yeah thanks um I mean, while you were responding, Rachel, I was just thinking about how interesting it is that, um, of course, that Hitler was referring to past examples of um, the destruction of communities and this kind of imperial focus. Uh, But, of course, the interesting thing is that he's not referring back to German colonialism. You know, that he's not talking back to the time where they're um, targeting Herrera and Norma peoples, for example, because... For him, seemingly, that it was a mistake not to be repeated the way in which the German Empire conducted itself. And so this is where Pete's article comes in and these imaginings of, of the yeah the American West versus the Nazi East, as he would say, but also the British Empire and yeah the way in which the British ran India. And yeah, the fact that for many Nazis, um, and they reflected on this, that for them the British shouldn't really have a problem with what they're doing because they also have a racial way of um, organizing their societies or I mean their colonial societies but the, so um, so they're, they're looking back to this kind of how can one successfully undertake these population managements or destructions um, but they're looking elsewhere for it and of course ultimately for the Nazis, there was no place for Jews in this empire, but it doesn't change the fact that the Jews found themselves within one nonetheless, and that, of course, they were still affected by the colonial policies of the Nazis, even if they weren't ultimately, yeah, supposed to be a part of that. Michelle, you mentioned that that part of your kind of intellectual progression was this uh, acquaintance with an embrace, embrace maybe not as, is not the right word. I'll let you correct that if that's not right, but of genocide studies. Um, I wonder, it, Rachel has talked about how she's comes through the lens of Holocaust studies. I wonder how that impacted your kind of interaction as you imagined this volume and as the way you responded to these essays, whether about genocidal imaginings or, or maybe something else. Um, yeah, how to answer that question. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I guess what I can say is from my perspective and coming from a background of genocide studies, it's I want to encourage that we we think about the the literature on on genocide and what it can tell us about persecution and uh, racism and mass violence um uh, but we can do that as i did in my uh own book um i didn't take examples of of genocide but i still came from that perspective and kind of tested how that helped us to understand the dynamics of of colonial violence so with the spanish civil war for example well yeah maybe um we can't argue genocide there but it still helps us to to understand this what is specifically inherently racialized violence and how that differs from the killing of civilians in 19th century within Europe, for example. I mean, where there's where those dynamics lie. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I'll reflect on my 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 yeah. uh, background. <laughs> yeah. But maybe also if I can come in here yeah. because I certainly a sort of thought came to mind is that um of course the way that Holocaust studies has, has developed is that it's it's quite a I mean, it is quite a Western discipline. Um, and to an extent, there is this argument that, you know, we also shouldn't just be talking about, you know, how do you sort of fit the the Holocaust within these more sort of global, wider patterns, but um, also, you know, to, to decolonize Holocaust studies in a way um, to invite in different perspectives and people with different backgrounds, for example, from the global south. Um, I mean, recently, there's been a big movement towards um, Eastern European scholars as well, um, really integrating them into discussions, um, because, of, you know, for a long time, it has been very sort of, you know, Amer- initially American dominated, and, and you know, Germany um, 
still almost has an, an interesting relationship with academic scholarship on, on the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, for example, I think there's only maybe one or two um, actual sort of chairs for Holocaust studies in Germany. A lot of the time it sort of falls under this category of of um, modern history, more or less. Um, so what Michelle's saying there is like this idea of, um, I guess, looking at uh, these sort of fundamental aspects of the Nazi regime or Nazi violence from a new perspective that's not necessarily located within this uh, national socialist ideological sphere. So literally just, and, and, you know, it happens already in Holocaust studies to an extent, you know, people would bring in um, different aspects of, you know, gender theory. Um, and, and for whatever reason, there has tended to be more sort of resistance to this colonial side of thing. Um, but I think, you know, literature on, colonial history or, or genocide studies, this more sort of wider, um, these wider concepts can really shed a new light on mm -hmm. things that we, you know, we sort of think that we've read this before or that we've seen these examples before and we've looked at it. But if you only sort of look at it um, from your own expertise, um, then, you know, maybe you sort of end up asking the same questions again. And so mm -hmm. by, by bringing in scholars with different backgrounds, I think that's also an important part of this this debate. Yeah, I think it's also the case that, I mean, and we really want to emphasize this, even though I think that maybe sometimes work like ours is sometimes willfully misunderstood and misrepresented. It's not that colonialism is suddenly supposed to explain everything. It isn't. It's just one lens, just like Rachel said, there's gender or post-colonialism. We have all these different ways through which to view something and how to research it and what it can tell us. And we don't see whether the harm isn't that because it's not trying to explain everything but it has brought new understandings to um different population policies amongst the nazis but also to jewish experiences i think elizabeth harvey's uh, source commentary makes clear that that shows us um by asking those questions it shows us a different side to things and also raises maybe the issue of yeah the responsibility of the historian because we only know that which we ask so you know, the, what harm is there in as, asking these questions? 